All right. Good evening and welcome to Thursday night at Living Word Family Church. This is uh, These Final Days Ministries. I'm Pastor Ryan Speakman. Serve These Final Days Ministries. Hi. <laughs> Trying to get my stuff going here. I'm Pastor Ryan Speakman serving under my favorite pastor in the whole world. Sincerely, Pastor Maureen Collins. All right. Let's give, give our pastor a hand, my pastor a hand. Yeah, and uh, thank you for being here tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining us online. We have um, seven currently watching online, and I think more will come on as we uh, as as we progress here. And we are going to have fun tonight because we always have fun. Because we always have fun. Yeah, thank you for for filling in. <laughs> yeah, thank you for filling in for Cheryl. Yep, keep her in your uh, keep her in your prayers. So, so uh, welcome, Angel Page. Uh, Angel, why don't you let, let us know where you're watching from? Glad to have you uh, join us. So, so we are in the middle of a what's turning out to be kind of a long study on the Book of Revelation. So, um, I don't know if you guys uh, heard uh, Kay, um, one of our class members here, talking a you know month, month and a half ago, whatever. But she was telling me about a lady here in town named Cindy, and I haven't met her yet, but uh, she's been doing a, um, a ladies' Bible study for years, and she decided to take on the Book of Revelation, and she's in her second year of doing it now. So I'm not, I'm not the only one taking my time getting through it. Yeah. So, <laughs> but we're go, we're going deep because it's a very, very deep topic and we want to, um, you know, we're being led by the Holy spirit and there's a lot that there's a lot that, uh, John, um, was compelled to convey to us when he was on that Island, uh, in the Aegean sea, right. Uh, there's a lot that Jesus wants to convey to us, which, which is why he delivered this prophecy to John. And, um, and we, we're, we're going to get it. We're going to, we're going to get every, every, every tiny bit that the Holy Spirit has for us. Amen. So let's all uh, read this together so we remember the blessing that goes along with this. So Revelation chapter 1, 3, everybody read. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Amen. And this was written 2,000 years ago, but the time really is near now. Like it really is. How do we know? How, how do we know the time is, you know, like actually it's imminent. It's, it's, it's our generation that's going to see all these things come to pass because we're already, say again, <laughs> another class. Uh, we're already seeing the signs come to pass, right? Dozens and dozens and dozens of things that the Bible tells us have to be in place, have to take place before the return of Christ. It's all been happening. Uh, especially in our generation, and really the process began, you know, over about the last hundred years or so. But um, but things are just really heating up. We all know it. We all sense it, which is why we all come together on Thursdays and uh, and dig deep, right? So um, please remember our uh, class schedule for December. So I didn't mean to start this in December, but it looks like it just kind of happened. Uh, this this new plan that that w was you know direct instruction from above, right? To, uh, to switch my class from every week to every other week. And the reason for that is so I, I, I've got to get part three of my book series done. So here's part one and part two. And part three has been coming soon for way too long now, right? So um, uh, just as an experiment, so last week was Thanksgiving, right? It's been, I've gotten a lot done on the book. So this is working, you know, when you follow the Holy Spirit's instructions, just, you know, try not to ask questions. I kind of drag my feet on it. Um, but that said, uh, tonight is December 2nd, right? Uh, oops, I should have my pointer here. You guys can't see my cursor. Hold on. Tonight's December 2nd. Next next Thursday, one week from tonight, is December 9th, and that's when we're going to have our special guest, Adi Bedin, talking to us from Israel. So we're going to do a Zoom meeting with her or, uh, uh, you know, um, a Facebook message or me, whatever it is. But um, she's going to be joining us online, and she's a phenomenal speaker, and she's going to be teaching us about Hanukkah. So it should be excellent. So we are having class next week, but I'm not teaching. I will be back the next uh, Thursday teaching. Then we take off the week of Christmas, and then I'll be back um, two days before New Year's Day, and we'll wrap up uh, the year with, with, uh, with one more class. So everybody got that? And there are uh, paper copies of the schedule if anyone needs one. And, um, and I'll post this on the Facebook page, too, so people watching online know what our schedule is. So, so uh, because I'm going to every two weeks now, I'm, I'm going to really hit it hard and give you guys two weeks worth of, you know, knowledge and, and revelation in, in one night. Sound good? And uh, so good, good thing I can talk fast. Yeah, I know, right? So in other words, I'm going to do my usual thing, just dump a bunch of stuff on you and, and uh, hope, hope most of it sticks. So, so um, again, uh, next week, Adi will be joining us. This is her presentation, Bring Light into the Darkness. 
Uh, it's it's about um, Hanukkah and and what it really means to Jewish people. She works at uh, Yad Vashem Museum, which is the famous Holocaust museum in Jerusalem. So the context, of course, is the Holocaust. But again, it, it, it's about Hanukkah. So this is a different presentation than she gave to us uh, about a year ago, whenever she she visited us last online. Now, um, her and her amazing, extraordinary husband, Noam, and I've been friends with, with these two for um, almost 10 years now. Pam and I have been friends with them. Um, I met Noam uh, indirectly on my first trip to Israel back in 2012. But uh, they actually had been to Havasu, and here's the proof. This is in a picture taken in Pastor Bybee's church. This is uh, uh, John's church, actually, um, uh, Community Presbyterian. Do you guys still call it that? Or? It's called Christ Chapel now. Okay. I know they break, broke away from the Presby- main Presbyterian. That's a long story. But um, so, yeah, so here, here's a D with uh, Noam and then Pam and me. They do, they do want to come to Havasu again soon. Uh, it's just because of COVID. They haven't been able to make the trip. And uh, so we're going to be watching for them. Um, hopefully in the spring, they're going to come and see us in person. Here's, I just want to throw this in because I, I think she photoshopped it because I actually look younger and better looking in this picture. But this is a DNI at the Yad Vashem Museum in Jerusalem. I was her first English language tour. She just, it was just me. And her, uh, her bosses there let her do that just to see if she could actually do an English language tour. I was the guinea pig. She did amazing. So now she leads huge groups of English speaking, you know, visitors at Yad Vashem Museum. So, all right. So uh, please remember, go to thesefinaldays.org for all things pertaining to this ministry, including my book series, the podcast, uh, the videos of all my trips, several trips to Israel, one trip to Lebanon earlier this year. Uh, and then also, while you're there, please... And I'm not begging for money. Nobody get uptight. But uh, if you feel so led by the Holy Spirit, click on the donate button. And I do appreciate all the uh, the financial support for the ministry. It's helping um, these Final Days ministries grow, uh, do new things. We have a couple of, so that's my cue to pass offering bucket in the class here. But yes, yeah, sincerely, thank you everyone in the class for your for your generosity and also watching online. But uh, we have a couple of projects in the works right now. Um, so one is, uh, I need to get to Africa. This has been on my heart and Pam's heart and Elijah's heart, you know, uh, ever since the Lebanon trip. This is, this is when I really started getting instruction for this. This is our main guy, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Pastor Jay Mutali and his lovely wife, Didi, in, uh, in South Africa. And he's now our official These Final Days affiliate there. We're, we're, we'll see what, what God does with this, you know, covenant relationship. But, um, but I'm working on raising funds to get over to Africa. And they, I, just every day, it seems like I'm getting new pastors from Africa pinging me. I've got this group that's, that's steadily growing on Facebook Messenger called Africa Pastors Fellowship. And they're all kind of begging, please come over here and teach us about the end times because they're just not getting that teaching. And Pastor Jay's, you know, got my books and, and I'm going to bring more over when I go. We also still very much have this in the works. So I think I told you two weeks ago that that phase one, which is bringing our Australian marine biologists to meet with our Israeli chemist in uh, in, in Jerusalem, um, that's phase one, and that's to figure out the ingredient called Onika. There is a second, even more mysterious ingredient called Ma'ala Ashan, and I recruited none other than Ben Wave, Benjamin, to help with this. It's oh, this is going to be fantastic. So um, we just got this book. We just purchased this book. Uh, online and um, in here this gives us a very profound clue about what that missing ingredient is so phase two of the incense project is underway I'm not going to get into great detail I think I'm going to set aside uh, one of our classes probably in January maybe February and and I'm going to spend the whole class um, going back over the incense project but especially phase two and I should have some cool show and tell stuff by then like actual stuff I can bring to class and, and show you and let you look at besides just a book so, um, yes, so that's it for announcements. Wow. So we can dive into our study. Any questions or anything before we get going? We're 10 minutes into the hour. That is not bad at all. Plenty of time for content tonight. Tonight's going to be really good. I got to ask you guys before I start, do, do you guys, remember, we're only meeting every two weeks now. So do you guys want meat tonight or you want milk? You know what I mean by that? <laughs> Tom laughs. Just say you want meat because that's what you're getting tonight. So, yeah, so this is, you know, we, we, we've talked about this. We've talked about how, um, oh, this is tonight, right? We've, we've talked about this, this concept, this idea that, 
that uh, the reason that that we've got you know all these th- these amazing details about Jesus in Revelation chapter one, the introduction. Now we're going to the seven letters to the seven churches, Revelation chapters two and three, and again these seven letters together constitute one giant message to the body of Christ throughout the ages, especially the end times church. That's reasonable to assume, right? That's that's the that's the primary ultimate audience for the book of revelation so so as we're going through the seven letters uh the same thing's happening we're getting a lot of information a lot lot of details do you remember the theory that i conveyed to you guys two weeks ago as to as to why this is all necessary you know we're still a couple chapters away from the good stuff like where's the prophecy stuff where's the stuff about the end of the world and you know what events are going to take place and what listen we're going there and it's going to be amazing and we're going to go deep with all that too but in the meantime, we're taking our time and we're letting Jesus do what he, what he, I believe, intended to do, which is establish in us a firm, solid, fo- spiritual foundation so that we are ready not only to read about what we're going to be reading about, because the book of Revelation, I mean, I mean, most Christians just flat out avoid it because it's scary and weird and crazy, right? But, but again, we're, we're not doing that, obviously. We're going to go deep. But, um, but not, only, not only preparing us to read what we're going to be reading over the coming months, but, but actually preparing us, you ready for this? And you guys know what I believe about this to actually go through what we're going to be reading about. So I, I do believe that we are the generation that's going to see these things. We're already seeing these things come to pass. Um, I, I believe that we're the generation and you know, the younger you get in the room, you know, go toward the back of the room there, the more likely, of course, you know, it's going to be his generation, right? But, um, but, but I do believe that all of us in here or most of us are, are going to go through the seven year great tribulation, the time of the Antichrist. We've got to have a solid spiritual foundation. You can't just ride this thing out. You just can't. That's so clear from scripture. You can't just say the prayer of salvation, then show up at church and just kind of, you know, everything will work out. It, it, you know, I'm pan trib. It's all going to pan out in the end. Not according to the word. We, we've, we've got to be ready for what's coming. And tonight is going to bring us a long way toward, uh, toward what, what the father's really looking for. So we're, we're in that we're uh, in the first letter to the first church, which is the church at Ephesus. And this is what's known as the loveless church. So, so remember what's, what's the magic number in the book of revelation. Mm-hmm. Seven. We see all kinds of sevens, right? Uh, John who brought our dessert tonight. Thank you, John. Give John a hand. He brought salami and cheese. It's, he actually brought a meal for you, right? But he was so excited. He told me before class, Hey, this was cool. I was at, was it Burger King? Oh, Carl's Jr. Carl's Jr., right, next door. And, and his number came up, and guess what his number was? The number seven. It's exciting, <laughs> right? But, you know, it's like, hey, this is a confirmation. That's going to be, hey, we're going to have class tonight, right? Listen, the number seven is so prominent throughout the entire book of Revelation. So just where we're at now, we have seven churches that are represented by seven lampstands, and then we have seven letters written to the seven churches, specifically the seven stars, which represent the seven angels of the seven churches. And then even in the, each letter themselves, the construct of each letter, each letter contains seven core components that we, that we looked at last week and, and briefly the week before, so we're not going to do that again. But let's, let's uh, so yeah, number seven, right? But let's look, at, uh, let's, let's look at this very, very briefly. So just remember where we're at, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right? And it, this is red ink, so who's talking here? This is Jesus' own words, and he's talking to the Apostle John, uh, dictating to him what to write, right? Jesus says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Of course, that's Jesus himself, which we know from, from chapter one. It tells us, hey, it's Jesus who, who holds the seven stars and, and walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Verse two, I know your works your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. So this is the commendation part of the, of the, of the letter where he's given them like a compliment. You guys are doing really good in this area. This, this is good. I I appreciate it. I I'm proud of you guys for this. Right. Uh, and he says, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. That sounds like strong words. You know, when Jesus talks, especially like after his ascension to the father, when he was here on earth, um, that when he taught things, it, it would come across mostly, usually like like in a softer tone, and he'd teach in parables and all that. Um, by the time we get to the book of Revelation, Jesus is being very, very direct, very kind of kind of hard in 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 his in his speech. Right? Um, again, these are strong words. You have tested those who say they're apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And this is a compliment to them, right? Which tells us, I think, that we should be testing everyone who we 
who we listen to, who we sit under, who are the teachers, and, and pay attention to which ones are for real and which ones aren't. And there's only one way to know for sure. Well, there's two ways. First is the Logos word, knowing your Bible, okay, as best you can. And when you hear teachers, preachers, you read people's writings, uh, pay attention and, and does it line up with Scripture. But, but I would say even more important than that, it, you have to have both. But one level beyond that, which we really need, is what? It's the... Yes, Tom, I need you to answer that. Yeah, Tom, always, Tom gets this, man, because he always is the first to answer that. The rest of you say, too, Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so we have to have that second component, which is that rhema word from God, the Holy Spirit uh, revealing to us and impressing upon us, right, what's true and what's not. Um, and you, verse 3, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and not become weir- weary. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you. So here's the, the criticism, the, the, the critique, the warning, right? You have left your first love, meaning loving Jesus. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. So are, is it, are our works a, 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 a manifestation, a sign of our love for Jesus? Like what we actually do? The words that come out of my mouth, the actions I take? Yeah, according to Jesus right here. It's not based on, you know, you know, touchy feely and I just, just love Jesus so much. And, you know, he's, and that's all great having feelings, but Jesus, Jesus is relating our love for him to our works. This is pertinent to tonight's lesson or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. Now here we are tonight. This is tonight's verse, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay. So, um, who here has read this before you've read, you've read this letter in the book of revelation and, and uh, did, you, did you take time to pause on this group? You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So, so he's given them a compliment. You've had patience. You've persevered. You've tested those. Herba. Then he gives the criticism. Uh, you've, you've left your first love. You better repent or I'm going to take your lampstand. And then we're back to another compliment. And, and th- so this is interesting. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. What does this have to do with us? So... Say that again? Okay, gold star for Wanda for asking the million dollar question. She says, who are the Nicolaitans? Okay, that's, that's the key question. Because if we really want to go deep with this, if we really want to get, Jesus isn't just, you know, throwing out words there and having a casual conversation. He, he wants to convey something and ultimately to us. So, so Rex, have you ever seen the first church of the Nicolaitans up on Acoma Boulevard or... Or, or have you seen them in the airports passing out flowers, the Nicolaitans? Or was that somebody else? Remember those guys, the Hare Krishna back in the 70s? Remember them? Yeah. They're not allowed to do that anymore, I guess, or if they're even still around, right? Oh, yay, Devo's here. Welcome. Uh, Peter Kembo watching from Africa who says, we want meat. Amen, brother. We're doing it. Uh, Lonnie Wilkins, let us know where you're from. Carol from Cincinnati, welcome. Angel Page is from Indiana. So welcome again, Angel. All right, so... so you know, here again, it's so tempting, it, not just with the book of Revelation, but with, with the whole word, the, the entire Bible, to get to something, and it's a little detail, and what does that even mean? I don't know what that is, and we can just skim over it, but, but Wanda asked a very important question. Who are the Nicolaitans? What do I care? What do I care? Because this is a letter to me, especially us as the end times church, and Jesus is saying, this is really good. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, Okay. But he's not talking about a group that, that exists. They don't even exist. So, so doesn't that kind of like contradict my, my theory? It's not a theory. My, my, you know, my point that the book of Revelation is, is intended for the last day's church, which is us. How can that be if Jesus is talking about some group that, that literally hasn't existed for um, almost 2,000 years? They existed at the time that John wrote this, back in the year AD 90. They existed maybe another 100 years beyond that at the most. And then they disappeared into history. So what's going on here? What does this have to do with us? Everything. It's extremely pertinent. Oh, my gosh. Is it important? You ready? Okay. So um, do you guys... Oh, I should have put this up. That was so so uh, dumb of me. Yeah, look, Wanda, your question. That's literally what she said, word for word. So, <laughs> so you get your own slide, Wanda. Who are the Nicolaitans? That, that is the question. All right. So um, do you guys remember this guy? And I'll, and I'll remind you, this is, this is my favorite author. This is my favorite book, this one book, okay, my favorite book uh, in the entire world outside of the Bible itself. 
This, this, in my opinion, is the most credible commentary on Scripture that exists on earth today, uh, besides the Bible itself. Okay, so we start with the Bible. But, but why would I say this about this guy? And here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up his slide here just so he could look at it. And I've got that book cover on the screen, right? But, um, but why would I say that about him? Why, why do I like Irenaeus so much? Does anyone remember? Who is Irenaeus? He is uh, basically the apprentice, the apprentice of the apprentice of John, the apostle, I believe. Of John himself, exactly. Gold star. I haven't given out gold stars in months. I'll, I'll start doing it again. Yes, uh, thank you for remembering that. So I'm going to remind you guys, okay, so who, who Irenaeus is. So, so he looks very unapproachable here, nothing to do with our generation, right? I'll tell you, it, it's I mean, look how thick this book is. And, and I'll tell you, if you sit down with this book and start reading it, and in a, in a few people I know about it, I, uh, Pastor Jay, I think, bought it in Africa, and then John, my co-host on the, on the radio, uh, you know, I, I don't think Bill has the book yet. But, um, but when you read that, you would swear that you're reading something written by someone who you sit next to in church today, just filled with the Holy Spirit, deep revelation, deep understanding of God's word. Irenaeus is ama amazing. Uh, why I say that he is the most credible source, like in terms of Bible commentary outside the Bible itself, in my opinion, uh, is because like Ben, remember, thank you, Ben, um, he was the protege of a guy named Polycarp, most of whose writings, unfortunately, have been lost to history. I would love to get my hands on Polycarp's writing, but they're gone or they're hidden in the basement of the Vatican or something, who knows, but we, we don't have access. Oh, and Pam and Uncle Dan are here and Susan Click, yay. Oh, Susan, here. Uh, ben, zoom in on that, show that to Susan. Susan, we got this book and I'm going to somehow, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll bring it on Sunday so you could take a look at it. Susan's kind of involved in our incense thing too, so yeah. <laughs> Anyways, very exciting. Welcome, Susan. All right, and Uncle Dan and Pam, I think I said hi to you guys already, love you guys. So, um, so yeah, so, so Irenaeus, um, uh, his mentor was Polycarp. Polycarp's mentor, Polycarp had one protege and that was Irenaeus, that was it. Uh, John the Apostle, who wrote the book of Revelation, who was one of Jesus's original apostles, he wasn't just a disciple, he was, the, he was in the inner circle of disciples, those, those top three that Jesus included in everything, right? So Peter, John, and John's brother James. And not only that, but John the Apostle was the one who the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us, Jesus loved the most. So, so when G, if Jesus ever had like one-on-one -on -one with just one disciple, like this is the guy I'm closest to, which might explain why John is the one disciple who survived all the way to old age. He wasn't martyred. God kept him alive long enough to write the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Arguably the, the one, not arguably it is, it's the one book in the entire Bible authored by Jesus himself because it's Jesus dictating this and, and showing this to John, right? So, um, so John, I mean, you would think that John like really knows his stuff. John taught Polycarp and Polycarp in turn taught Irenaeus. And then Irenaeus in the year 180 AD produced this amazing book against heresies. You can get it on Amazon. It's not cheap. It's like 30 or 40 bucks if I remember right, but totally worth it. And the last 12 chapters are all about, you ready for this, John? The other John, both Johns, the book of Revelation. Okay, so about that much of the book is all about the book of Revelation. I love this book. <laughs> And what, and what he does, he gives, he, he, he gives, he, he explains things like, look, you know, I know this, this looks mysterious in the Bible, but here's what it actually means. And he's going based on, on actual, um, in essence, first person authority. This is what John taught Polycarp. And this is what Polycarp taught to Irenaeus. So, um, so here's what he has to say about the Nicolaitans. He has actually has a comment on them. Uh, Irenaeus says, and you probably can't read my screen, so I'm going to read it to you. The Nicolaitans are the followers of that Nicholas who was one of the seven first ordained to the diaconate, I'm sure I should have practiced that before I came here, to be like a deacon, right, by the apostles. So he's referring to uh, a gentleman named Nicholas, whose name, by name, in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, there were seven guys who the original disciples actually ordained to be their first deacons. Nicholas was among them, but Nicholas became a heretic, and that's what this book's about, right, against heresies. They ready for this? This is what Nicholas ended up doing. So he's, he's ordained directly by the disciples. He went off track, all right? Uh, it just goes to show you, many are called, few are chosen. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. Now, again, here's my question that I'm kind of hanging out there. What do the Nicolaitans have to do about us? What is it that Jesus wants us as the last day's church to be particularly on guard against? 
to really watch for. And, and what he's warning us against, I'll, I'll tell you, is, is, oh, I meant to edit that. It got messed up. Um, what he's warning us against is so rampant, not just in the world today, especially in the world, but in the body of Christ. Okay, this is, this is what Jesus is saying. You've got to fight against this, especially in the last days. You'll see it when, when, it, when I bring all this together. Um, no, but close. It's, 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 it's probably not what you think. And, and, and what I'm going to show you here even hypothetically goes against the grain of a lot of our Christian culture today, how we view Christianity, how it is that we're, we're, we're saved, what makes us a Christian. But, but it's not me talking. I'm going to show you what, what, what the word itself teaches, okay? So they lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. The character of these men is very plainly pointed out in the Apocalypse of John, which is the book of Revelation. That's what the word apocalypse means. That's the Greek word that we translate into revelation, right? Uh, when they are represented as teaching that it is a matter of indifference. Now, now, listen to this and think about all the people you know who do this. And I'm being sarcastic when I say this. You, you hopefully don't know anyone who does the first. I'm sure you don't know anyone who does the second. Uh, indifference to practice adultery and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Okay. So this is what Jesus is telling us to watch for, these two things. You want to hate these deeds. You want to, you want to fight against this culture, uh, adultery, and, and, and other early church fathers, when they commented, they, they, they said secular, sexual immorality. Uh, I'll get to this, okay? But eating things sacrificed to idols, do, like what does that even mean? That, that doesn't happen today, right? <laughs> I mean, in a way, but what do you mean it totally does? People idolize people, uh, other people all the time and will, and will, and they sacrifice to them. It does happen. It does happen. So, yeah, so, so, you're, so you're reducing this. So, so Irenaeus is talking about eating food sacrificed to idols. Now, listen, the Nicolaitans, this is how important they are to us, that they're not just mentioned in the first letter to the church at Ephesus. They are also mentioned, again, the Nicolaitans, in the third letter, as we'll see when we get there, to the church at, at Pergamos, okay? And, and in, that, in that context, uh, uh, Jesus is very upset because that church is actually letting these guys sit in the pews and, and remain part of the church, right? But they're, but they're that important that they show up. But Ben just reduced this idea of eating food, sacrifice idols to just idolatry in general. So you're headed in the right direction. That's exactly right. So, so, so does idolatry take place in the world today in various forms? Of course it does. But, but, but again, these are things that, it, that on the surface almost feel like kind of, imp you know, like not pertinent to, to us, to our generation, to the body of Christ and all that. Uh, but there, but there are two things that together um, constitute an overall concept that is running rampant in the world and even the body of Christ. I dare say, uh, and and let me let me get to it. It's actually our next slide. You'll see it. But I want to make a few comments here first, because there's one word I'm looking for that describes what it is that Jesus is is seriously warning us against, and we should take it seriously, and we don't take it seriously. We're uh, okay. Da da da. Um, okay, so other early church fathers who have commented on the Nicolaitans, there's a reason why I'm listing this, okay? Um, Hippolytus, I'm sure I'm pronouncing a few of these wrong, uh, Epiphan Epiphanius, uh, Theodoret, maybe I'm pronouncing them right, they sound pretty good so far, right? <laughs> so, uh, and th those three happen to agree with, Nic uh, with Irenaeus that this group was founded by Nicholas, who was one of the first deacons that the apostles themselves, the disciples in the book of Acts, ordained, right, to be deacons. Uh, and again, it just it causes you to pause, like, like this guy gets off into these terrible heresies. How, how could that even happen? Don't make any assumptions. Okay. So, uh, also Tertullian, and, and you've probably heard of, of, of all or most of these, uh, Bishop Isidore of Seville. These are all very, very famous early church fa fathers, St. Augustine or Augustine, right? Thomas Aquinas, very famous, Eusebius, uh, St. Jerome. Do you remember what's, what's cool about him? I've talked about him before. I've been to his his uh, cave that he lived in for a year in the Judean desert. Saint Jerome. Oh, Jerome. Yes. What am I thinking? You, I, 
<laughs> I wasn't going to skim over that. I had to figure out, yes, I've been to Jerome. Steepest city in the world. I love Jerome, yeah, between Sedona and Artists. Prescott. <laughs> so, um, and actually, to answer your question, yes, that town presumably is named after St. Jerome. So, gold star for John for that, right? Um, he, he also, I, I, if you never joke, so, <laughs> so um, he also uh, had a grotto under the, the church of the nativity in Bethlehem, which marks the spot where Jesus was born. I think it's a legitimate site. It, you go down underground, there's a cave, and it marks the spot where Jesus was born. And it makes sense that the early Christians would know because Mary would have remembered, yeah, that's where I gave birth. She would have pointed out. They venerated the site. They turned it into a thing, right? But they built a whole church over this. Well, while you're underground, if you go off into a, another tunnel, you come to a grotto, and St. Jerome did his work there. St. Jerome was the one who wrote the Latin Vulgate. And you remember what's cool about the Latin Vulgate? Like kind of kind of the central point to my whole ministry, teaching, writing? That's where we get the word repiamer. That's the Latin translation of the word harpazo in the Greek, which is where the, I know I'm going off now, the, but this is so cool. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, this is the quintessential rapture passage, and he talks about, then those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. That's what we shall always be with the Lord, right? Um, that's, the, that's considered the quintessential rapture passage. That phrase caught up in the Greek was harpazo. Uh, St. Jerome um, in, the, in the 4th century AD, working in Bethlehem, he, he, um, he penned the Latin Vulgate, and the Latin translation that he chose uh, for Harpazo is rapiamer. So that's where we get the word rapture. Did you know that? That's where we get the English word rapture from this guy, St. Jerome. And back on topic here, let me, let me reel that back in. And St. Jerome, again, he also commented on, on the Nicolaitans. Uh, and then finally, Clement of Alexandria, another very famous one. A lot of early church fathers, uh, most of them, commented on the Nicolaitans. Why? Do you know? Do you know that even in their heyday, the Nicolaitans were um, were, were actually a, you know a very small group. Uh, they 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 never had a lot of influence. But but what? But obviously, Jesus thought they were a big deal because he mentions them not once but twice, in a very bad way in the Book of Revelation, warning us you you need to hate their deeds. And again, what are their deeds? Uh, this weird sexual immorality. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you how weird it is. Okay, and then and then you'll see what I mean by what does it have to do with us? Okay. Uh, what the story is, is that Nicholas's wife was, plug your ears, Wanda, this is Aki, okay? Nicholas's wife, yeah, there she goes. Nicholas's wife was very, very beautiful, and, and so he divorced her so that the other men that were, like, following him in his congregation could, yeah, see, see where I'm going with this, Tom? I'm not going to finish, you know, that comment. But it's bizarre. And then eating food sacrificed to idols. What on earth? Why would this be a warning to us, Okay. Because of these things that these, these, these represent, I want to make sure I don't uh, miss any of my points here, okay? So, so what's so important about them? What do they represent, okay? The, the two things that history accused them of, again, and this is as per our quote here from Irenaeus, is uh, sexual immorality and, and idolatry in a sense, right? Eating forbidden foods. And, and if, if you were to take those two things that don't seem related and, and conflate them into a single concept, what is the concept? It's huge. Ready? Some, somebody say it. It's all over the screen there. Lawlessness. Thank you, lawlessness. And you've heard me talk about lawlessness more than once in this class. It's a key point. And, and, and what is it about lawlessness that is so amazingly interesting to us as the body of Christ, especially the last day's church? What, what's so interesting about this concept of lawlessness? This is, this is like the key right here. This is, this is what to be watching for, not just in our world, but in the church, okay? This is a key point about the Nicolaitans. They were part of the church. This, this is the point. These guys were part of the body of Christ. And, and what was it that they were practicing? What was the spirit that was on them? Lawlessness, okay? Lawlessness. And, and who do we relate lawlessness to? And when I say who, I mean an actual person who probably is alive in the earth today. Again, Hi. All over the screen. Okay, he's, he's muted, right? Okay. <laughs> I see your t-shirt, too. Very cool. Um, the Antichrist, exactly. So, so I've said this in here before, that, this, that the spirit of the Antichrist is lawlessness. If you were, if you were to pin one characteristic on, on the Antichrist, why is this important? Was this, was this matter to us? Because it's what we're supposed to be watching for right now. Pay attention. This spirit of lawlessness. And again, it is infiltrating the body of Christ. 
this, this, this culture and spirit of lawlessness, which is, which is the idea that, that, um, I'm saved by grace, which is a hundred percent true. But, but, um, does that give us license to, to just kind of live the way we want to live? You know, a lot of Christians operate that way. I, I don't know how many actually think that way, but a lot of Christians operate that way. You know, I'm saved by grace. Nobody's perfect. You know, I'm forgiven. Jesus washes away my sins. Uh, that's great. But, but see how that can open the door to lawlessness. And, and, and here's, here's what, here's what, what, uh, okay. Jesus is the one giving the warning here, but here I'm going to, I'm going to kind of like, like embellish what he's saying here, add to what he's saying here. Right. It's, it's, um, lawlessness is, is, is rejecting and not loving the law. Okay. What law am I talking about? This is so important. The law that says, you know, don't cross the street if there's no crosswalk. The law that says, you know, I've been to Israel, so I'm not allowed to visit Lebanon. I broke that law, right? Remember? Oh, okay. You just you just quoted one law out of many, and what what are you quoting from? It's a very important one. In fact, I, I love that John Gold Star for that because I would I would call that the the foundational law to all. 613 laws, the Jews say there's 613 meets vote or commands or laws, right? We're talking about the law of God, God's law. How many Christians love God's law? We love God's grace. I, I won't deny that. I like God's grace. I appreciate God's grace. I'm, I'm saved because of God's grace. I, I can never make it to heaven. I can never be fully reconciled to the Father just by following his law, okay? So, so thank God for grace. That's, that's the new covenant, right? But the new covenant does not do away with what is the core and the foundation of the old covenant, which is the law. So again, I'm going to ask you, and it's a rhetorical question, so don't try to answer or raise your hand or whatever, but um, how many Christians love God's law? We all love his grace. How many of us love his law? Can we love both simultaneously? Are we supposed to love both simultaneously? And is there a danger in, 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 in ignoring one in, in despising one, in, in living our lives like, like, like it does. Dallas Cowboys and God, but you can't love the Dallas Cowboys more than God. You can love your wife, but you can't love your wife more than God. And again, you're, you're, you're just on the very first commandment. That's the very first commandment, yeah. And there's, and there's a whole bunch besides that. Right. Right. And, and I don't want to get accused of like, you know, legalism or, oh, you know, here, here's another guy trying to put the law on the body of Christ. I'm not. I'm not at all. Paul says in, in the book of Romans, he says, look, Gentiles, meaning us, we're, we're, we're not Jewish. We weren't raised Jewish. We weren't, you know, educated in, in the Torah and all that formally. Uh, even Gentiles who don't know the law, nevertheless, they, 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 um, they live by the law. They practice the law because, because it's part of their, their new nature. So, so what's the new nature? I'm born again, and most importantly, Tom, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie all this together, but, you know, listen to this. You, 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 got, you, you, you know, we have to get this tonight. So we have 14 watching online. That's excellent. Well, Welcome, Bible everybody. talks about a lot of horrible things and horrible acts. Things. Yeah. That doesn't mean that God condones that. God is just simply calling it as it is, showing it yeah. what it is. And how you can take those horrible things and turn it into good. So we're supposed to stand up, and this is, this is so foreign to so many believers, and it was to me for many, many years. We need to stand up as bold, fighting soldiers in the kingdom of God that are fighting for God's grace and loving God's grace and also fighting for God's law and loving God's law. You don't have to know the letter of the law. Wow. <laughs> That's weird. What's, what's causing that? It's, it's, it's the, it's the enemy trying to shut us up. Wow. You know, people say that, but, but I kind of feel that way. Yeah. John, see what you can do with that. John's good at that. Um, people watching online. Oh, Carrie Schreffler's watching now. Uh, Carrie, you say it depends on how it is. Let me know what you mean by that interpretation and people watching online. Can you still hear me? Okay. Cause we have a fire alarm going off for all of a sudden. See, I start preaching hellfire and brimstone and look what happens. I set off the fire alarm. That was a good joke. <laughs> it's okay. Is it okay if I keep going? You guys, okay, I'm going to keep going. Enemy, you don't, you don't win this one. So uh, the Antichrist is known as the man of lawlessness, right? Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, while we work on the fire alarm. Um, Andrea says she can hear it, but, but can you still hear me is the question. Hope you can. 
But uh, Paul says, when he's talking about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. Okay, we know, we know this conclusively. You know, that's, that's who he's referring to, the man of lawlessness, right? And, and look, look, what he, look what he directly related to, not just in the same sentence, but in the same section of this sentence. This is impressive, huh? I just keep teaching like, like this incredibly loud, buzzy noise. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. What, what's that word there? John. Can you see the word? It's apostasy. All right. What is apostasy? What is apostasy? And Pam can hear it. Yeah, isn't that funny? Devo saying, what a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> this must be good, what we're talking about tonight, man. This must be hitting the enemy hard, right? Apostasy literally means believers falling away from the faith, defecting from the faith, okay? And the, and the ultimate manifestation of this is, is um, forfeiting our salvation. It's actually a forfeiture of our salvation. You guys okay? This, there's still work on the fire alarm. We're just going to keep going. Um, oh, uh, my wife is watching Pam, and she says fire alarms were just checked this week. Well, they work. We're checking them. Any, any idea how to shut them off? I'm just going to keep... Call your, call your father I'm going to keep teaching. Huh? Has a key to turn it off, but we do, I do not know who have a key. Oh, okay. My best guess is... Uh, try, try calling Ernie, and, and don't call the fire department because they'll, they'll charge us money for a false alarm. Oh, I hope not, gosh. Ernie. So, okay, now, now watch this again. Apostasy, falling away from the faith. And look how it shows up exactly where, where Paul talks about, he, he calls the Antichrist, he puts this, this, this term on him, the, the, the man of lawlessness. Okay, this is not a small thing. And again, what law are we talking about? We're talking about God's law, right? I, I, I'm going to get some gold stars for this. I'm going to keep teaching, <laughs> right? Man, you guys okay? Okay, watch this. A little bit later in the same uh, book and chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, Paul makes this comment. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Uh, again, what, what's the concern here? Is, is the world lawless? Of course it is. The world d doesn't know God's law, doesn't care about God's law. I'm talking about people who aren't born again. They're not Christian. They're not Jew, right? They don't care about God's law. They don't believe in it. They don't follow it, whatever. Yeah, of course the, the world is lawless. Is that what Paul is concerned about here? Why even mention it? We know the world's not saved, right? That's why we're trying to get them saved. He's talking about the church. He's talking about the body of Christ. It could not be more clear in the context. And again, what, what, what's this word here? Apostasy. It's, it's a whole bunch of Christians defecting from the faith. That's what that word means, okay? And watch this. Jesus himself warns against this, okay? So, so I love this, this screenshot here because this is a riot somewhere. Maybe it's like the Oregon riots or something. I'm not being facetious when I say that. This, is, this was taken recently, and Minneapolis or someplace, who knows. But, but, but what this is, is this is lawlessness in the world, which I will agree is stronger than ever. It's more intense than ever, the spirit of lawlessness. It's the Antichrist is on the move. The spirit of Antichrist is getting this world ready for, for, for the actual Antichrist, the person, the Antichrist, to show up and, and to rise to power. That's what you're seeing. When you turn on the news and you see these, the, 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 you know, the United States, all, all of our, you know, a bunch of our major cities on fire, that's the spirit of Antichrist directly hard at work this spirit of lawlessness. And even Jesus told us right before the seven-year Great Tribulation starts, this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, his great end times dissertation, what we know is the all of it discourse. Let's see if we have any, uh, yeah, Aunt Pam says you ticked off the enemy. I still got 15 people watching. That's, that's funny. Thanks for putting up with this. Generally, if you hear a fire alarm, you're supposed to leave the building. My wife said that. I was just thinking that, like, like are we sure that it's not like the real thing? It's not. We'd smell smoke or something. It's so weird, though. So, so watch this. Jesus himself says this, his great end times dissertation. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Is he talking about the world? The world's already lawless. The world already doesn't have love. Uh, yeah, please do. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Jesus is talking about the church. He's talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about Christians. Lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. And then remember what he says that to what we're reading right now in Revelation, his, his, what he's saying to the church at Ephesus, you've forgotten your first love 
And then he, he commends him. He says, but you are fighting against lawlessness. This is, this is good, but you better return to your first love. So, so what love is Jesus referring to here? Primarily, it's love of, of, of him and the Father and the Holy Spirit and, and also of each other, okay? So fellowship with other believers. But, but because of lawlessness, because of, of, of a lack of love for God's law. I love God's law, okay? Oh, thank you, guys. I don't know what they did, but give them a hand. <laughs> and Pam says, hush, Pam. It, that's Pam's aunt. Um, yeah, so just thank you, and Pam. And I think the fire alarm heard you too because it just went off. Okay, great. Yeah, my ears are like literally ringing. And I'm not stopping. Sorry. No, I'm not going to apologize to the enemy. But we're not stopping. We're just going to keep going. That's funny. That happened. Okay. Not, not a coincidence. I think uh, Devo's right about that. Okay. So, but watch this. So G- Jesus says, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Do you know that this concept shows up? throughout the seven letters to the seven churches, as we'll see. In fact, he actually says that word for word in one of the seven letters later. He says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Is this pertinent to us? It is. And this gospel, the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And do you know the very next verse, verse 15, is where Jesus describes the abomination of desolation, that event that the Antichrist does halfway through the seven-year great tribulation where he seats himself in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. That's actually the very next verse here that we're not seeing on this screenshot, verse 4. Paul says that, right? But Jesus says in the very next verse, verse uh, 15, therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let him who read understands, right? Um, understand. Uh, so so what I'm pointing out here is, is just a couple of verses before Jesus describes the middle of the great tribulation. He says lawlessness will abound. This is, we shouldn't be surprised. We should be shocked if it wasn't happening. Lawlessness is rampant in the world. It's a spirit. Listen, I'll, I'll say something else to you real quick, John, while, it's, while I'm thinking of it so I don't forget. Oh, I thought it was going to start going again. That's okay. We're going to keep going anyways. That, that in this world, in my opinion, you guys tell me if you kind of get the same vibe here. In my opinion, in, in this world, we've never seen the spirit of law. It's always existed in the world. We've always had, you know, uh, people who, who despise God's law, sure. But just the law in general. Just, you know, when you, when you despise God's law and, and, it, and it just, just grows and grows in here, pretty soon you're going to despise all law, all earthly, earthly authority, governments, everything, right? But have you ever seen it? I don't know if it's, this ever happened in, in, in world history. Certainly not globally like we're seeing it today, but have you ever seen it where even it's even institutionalized? Lawlessness is institutionalized. Here's what I mean by that. There are voices in government around the world, including and especially the United States, who, who pr- are promoting lawlessness, true or false, okay? Even this stuff, people burning stuff in the streets, yeah, do it. L- let those who, who want to go home, go, go home. Let those who want to burn, burn. That was, I forget who it was. It was a mayor or a governor or something of somewhere else, not here, thank God. But um, voices in media, right? Very, very powerful voice in me promoting the spirit of lawlessness. It's really weird. What's going on? What it, it's a good thing to have riots and and destroy innocent people's businesses. Uh, you know, even even kill people, burning down police stations, burning you know police cars. Th- this is this is a good thing. We're doing something positive. Are you guys hearing this in the in the media at all? You hearing it from politicians at all? It's a spirit. D- you know, you can you can be mad at the people. You can get all political. Uh, or you could get where, where God is, which is just look at this for what it is. It's the spirit of Antichrist on the loose in the world. As it grows in the world, you know, we're all watching for the great end times revival. We're all, we're all you know, believing for that great end times harvest. I agree in Jesus' name. Yes, yes, I, I, I want to see that too. I want to see an end times revival. What the Bible actually describes is, is kind of the opposite. It's a great apostasy coming in these times, right? Because as the spirit of lawlessness grows in this world, it is infiltrating the body of Christ, okay? It's infiltrating the church. Is it serious? Okay, there, there are consequences to despising God's law. And how do we despise God's law? We ignore it. It's not important, okay? The law is passed away. I'm not under the law. Th- those, are, those are such misquotations of scripture, okay? The book of Hebrews doesn't say that the law is pa- passed away. It says it's in the process of passing away. Well, the Bible says the law is obsolete. No, it doesn't. That's the book of Hebrews also. The, the author of the book of Hebrews, I think it was Paul, said that the law is becoming obsolete. 
When does it finally become fully obsolete? When, when Jesus comes back, and maybe even beyond that, I, 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 lately I've been thinking, wait, does that actually happen at the second coming, or does it happen with the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem? Uh, then, it, then it won't be needed anymore. In fact, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I, I will never apologize to you guys for this. I get some of my best revelations standing up here with a microphone in my hand, right? Yes, because during the millennial reign, there's still, it says that there's still sinners who are outside the walls of, of, of the holy city, and even to the point where at the end of the seven-year great tribulation, or um, millennial reign, at the end of the millennial reign, this is Revelation chapter uh, chapter 19, that, that there's there's a, a, another war, what we call the war of, of Gog and Magog, right? So, so, so is the law still pertinent throughout that time? Of course, and there's still people rejecting it. So, but the point is this, the law is not gone. Uh, go ahead, John. Well, the thing about lawlessness is to our, the entire body, and I can take the book of Esther, for example, the person there that's the unlawless person is Haman, who has plotted against the Jews to completely destroy the entire Jewish race. Yeah. And Mordecai is, of course, the uncle of Esther, and Esther has been given kind of the job of going before the king, which could cost her her life, yep. to speak up for her race against the man of lawlessness. And Mordecai tells her, he says, if you don't go and speak, or it doesn't, it won't matter because somebody else will be called by God to do it. Exactly. God will save his people, but if you don't go do it, you and I... See, and this is, this is why I'm throwing this on you and throwing it on myself right now is, is, again, are we reading the book of Revelation just for fun, just for academic purposes, or do we want to do what we, what we keep reading at the start of every class, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3? He, he who hears it, who, who receives it, who, who keeps it, it says, keeps the word written in here, then let's understand what he's really saying and take it seriously. We're in serious times, man, and it's going to get a lot more serious from here. It really is. You, you don't believe me? You know? Scott, Scott Zins is watching from uh, Minnesota. Welcome, Scott. Yeah, exactly. Do you know? Do you know? And I just got something else that that just confirms that revelation again. Tom, thank you for being here in the class. Rex and Wanda, John, John. The, I get I get some of my best revelations just standing here in front of the class. Uh, in Matthew chapter five, Jesus says says uh, Don't think that I came to abolish the law. I did not come to abolish the law. He's talking about he's talking about God's law, his Father's law. But I came to fulfill it. And, and then people will say, well, he fulfilled it on the cross. It's not true. It's not true. And it, he's not even done talking yet. And, and he, he tells us that's not true because he says, he says, I tell you the truth, uh, not one jot or one tittle, those are the tiniest little marks in the Hebrew alphabet, not one jot or one tittle will by any means pass from the law until all is fulfilled, ready for this, until heaven and earth pass away. Have heaven and earth passed away? No, then the law has not. Jesus didn't come to abolish it. So in what way does he fulfill it then? Listen, he 100% fulfills the law, okay? But let me show you how he does it. It's not that the law goes away. It's not that it goes away at all. Uh, does anyone know what, what Jewish um, festival we're in the middle of right now, the, the Jewish Holy Week? It's Hanukkah, exactly, Hanukkah. Okay, and this isn't one of the high Holy Weeks like the, like the three we get from Leviticus chapter 16 or 23. Um, this is this is a, a holiday that is not specifically ordained or mandated in Scripture, and yet it is mentioned. It says that Jesus went to Jerusalem during the Festival of Lights. That's Hanukkah. So Jesus himself went up to Jerusalem to observe this 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 holy time that we're in right now. And by the way, um, anyone who's interested, the tonight's the fifth night of Hanukkah. By the way, uh, how many nights are there to Hanukkah? Uh, nope. Great great guess. No. How many nights to Hanukkah? Okay, I, I'm going to get to that in our next slide here, okay? Huh? I think it's eight or nine. It's eight. Well, and because of that odd candle. Well, I'll, I'll explain it, okay? I'm going to explain it uh, briefly here, okay? Briefly-ish, right? You guys know me, right? <laughs> so, so let's talk about Hanukkah. We're in the middle of Hanukkah. This is the fifth night of Hanukkah. There are eight nights all together. So the last night of Hanukkah, let's see, five, six, seven, is Sunday night, right? And Sunday night at our local synagogue, which is on the same street as us, Acoma, go all the way up to Smith's. And, but before you get to Smith's, you'll see that church on your right-hand side. Look to your left, and there's a cute little white building with a, with a Star of David in the stained glass window, and that's our local synagogue. I'm, I'm there all the time. I'll be there Sunday evening at 7 o'clock, and, and we're going to do a party to celebrate the, the end of Hanukkah. And it's, it's so much fun. They have, like, special desserts they make, sufganiyo, latkes, all that stuff. It's sufganiyo, Rex, it's a jelly-filled donut is what it is. They call it sufganiyo, okay? 
You hear me? <laughs> so, so what is Hanukkah actually celebrating? This is fascinating. It's, it's this event here, okay? Uh, and I've got a lot going on the screen here, uh, which I make no apology for because it's all, you're gonna love this, okay? This is what Hanukkah is celebrating. Uh, most people don't know this. A lot of Jews don't even know this. And I know this because rabbis who have taught me about Hanukkah, including Rabbi Isaac, Rabbi Rosenbaum, we've had long conversations. They're like, yeah, Jews don't even know what this, what this story is about, right? I've heard both rabbis. These are our two local rabbis, Rosenbaum, retired. He's in Thailand now. Um, and then Rabbi Isaac from Los Angeles, right? But they've actually, I've actually sat in the synagogue while they've taught this story to the, to the congregation. Uh, most Jews don't even know this. This is, this is the, the ultimate story. Are you ready for this? Now, now watch, I'm trying to tie all this together, this idea of lawlessness and the Antichrist, okay? Okay, this is the ultimate type and shadow, the ultimate, the primary archetype of the Antichrist uh, in, in human history, okay? He's, he's definitely talked about in a prophetic sense in the Bible, but, uh, but where we actually get his full story is in a, a couple of books that didn't make it into our version of the Bible called uh, the books of Maccabees, uh, 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees. Amazing books, completely legitimate. This is the history of, of what's called the Maccabean Revolt, okay? You guys okay with this? I, I warned you there's going to be some meat tonight. It's not, I, I, you know, I'm not sugarcoating. We're, we're going to do some, some heavy lifting here a little bit. And, and a, a few of you have been in my class, and I've talked about this in, you know, times past. But, um, but, but this guy, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, now, now you see up here, I, I'm, I'm pointing to that, and if, you, and if you look, it's like, well, why is he so huge and he's in front of this fire? Well, that's a statue. What this is a statue of, though, it's a statue of Zeus, with the face of this emperor named Antiochus Epiphanes IV, okay? Uh, Antiochus um, was prophesied about in the book of Daniel, which, which was written uh, uh, several hundred years before he actually showed up on the scene, okay? Uh, but he was prophesied, and, and the full prophecy, I'm going to skip some, some, some points here and get to... Uh, also prophesied is who immediately preceded Antiochus, which is a very famous guy who died at the tender age of 30 in the palace of King Nebuchadnezzar of all things, right? Uh, Alexander the Great, you ever hear him? So Alexander was, was, he conquered the known world at that time and uh, very, again, very young guy, but he was prophesied about and he, and he was the hegemon of his day, right? You know, the Greek empire, right, Greece? And, um, and when he died, and this was prophesied in the book of Daniel, when he died, his, his kingdom, Alexander the Great's kingdom, splintered into four smaller kingdoms. And one of these was, was the Seleucid kingdom, which was based in Syria. Now, why do I find this interesting? Here's our first point about how this guy is like the ultimate archetype of the Antichrist. Because his, his kingdom was based in Syria, which means what city? Damascus, very good. I will make it to Damascus. One of these, I was this close, man, in April when I was in, in Lebanon. And Ben's going with me to Damascus. Don't tell my wife or his mom, okay? <laughs> I think his dad's cool with it, right? Great, now we're all accomplices. <laughs> right? Yeah, we, we were, like, Naif, when I was in Lebanon in April, he actually got us right to the border with, with uh, Syria, and, and I filmed the border crossing and then got screamed at because you're not supposed to do that. Very, very, you know, risky. I took pictures and all that. But it was closed because of COVID, exactly. But I'm going to go back and try again. I want to get to Damascus. And, and you know, you think, why on earth would you go there? It, it, you know, say, you know, knowing what I'm, I'm about, to, about to say, that is where the Antichrist is from. That is, that, that is where he's going to be based from is Damascus, okay? So why do I want to go there? Because it burns in here. And every time I travel, it's it's... Uh, God showing me things, like giving me deeper insight into things that I just can't get without actually going. I don't know. I don't know what, what he's going to show me going to Damascus, but, uh, but I am going and Ben is going. Right, Ben? <laughs> so uh, this is where Antiochus Epiphanes was, was based from, uh, Damascus, all right? So um, he, he, um, he, he, uh, uh, he commits something that looks so much like what we call the abomination of desolation that scholars to this day will argue uh, that that when Jesus talks about the and, w and when the word talks about the abomination of desolation, it must be talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, because it just looks so much like what what Paul describes. You know, seating himself in the temple, showing himself to be God, right? But but it's not possible. 
It's not at all possible because when Paul says that in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, he's clearly talking about a future event. He says, don't be deceived thinking that the day of our, uh, of our Lord, you know, uh, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him uh, will take place before the apost- apostasy happens and the, 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 uh, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, seats himself in the temple showing himself that he's God. That's the abomination of desolation. Uh, so, so when Paul wrote that, was he talking about a past event? No, he was saying, don't be deceived. That's, that's in the future. That hasn't happened yet. When Jesus talked about the abomination, actually called it by name, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 again, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, uh, as spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place. So when Jesus said that, was he describing a past event? Therefore, when you see this happen, then know that, you know, that the end is near, you know, Jerusalem's going to be surrounded by armies, get out of Dodge, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's, it's a future event. Antiochus Epiphanes, um, he, he uh, commandeered the temple in the year 168 BC, okay? Uh, Jesus was around 32 years old when he spoke those words, putting the abomination of desolation in his future. That was 200 years after Antiochus Epiphanes had, had, had committed his act. So, so I'm just laying the foundation here that that it's going to sound like the abomination of desolation. It's not, but it's the principal archetype of it, which is very pertinent to what I'm talking about here, Rex, about us as the body of Christ in the last days, fighting the spirit of Antichrist by loving God's law and fighting for God's law. Watch the connection here. This is, this is fun. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so, so the, so um, this was the second temple all right, the first one had been destroyed, and then the Jews went into the Babylonian captivity. That's when uh, the prophet Daniel, you know, saw his, his visions, uh, wrote, the, wrote the, the book of Daniel, right? And, and then it was cent- several centuries later that this temple was, was commandeered by this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, right? Uh, what he did, so the temple was dedicated in 516 B.C., and again, it was 168 uh, BC, by the time Antiochus, you know, did this act, took over Jerusalem. Um, he, he, this is, oh God, this is so pertinent. Antiochus, he, he was so smart. He, he did what his predecessor, Alexander, did. Uh, if you need to go in with your swords drawn and start killing people, if you need to do that to take control, the Romans did this too, okay? Once you have control, or, or to the extent that you can avoid bloodshed, do it. Avoid bloodshed. We, we want to live peacefully with these people. They're going to be subjugated under us. They're, we're going to rule over them, but, but we're not just out to destroy them. We, we're going to slowly over time, listen to this and, and think about our day and our culture and us today. We're going to slowly over time just kind of kind of whittle away at their beliefs. We're going to kind of kind of like like you know minimize Judaism and, and we're going to promote uh, our culture and, and secularism. Okay, uh, it, it, it's what's called Hellenization, like, like converting the, the, the culture in, in Judea, in Israel, to, to the Greek culture, right? We're going to just kind of kind of subtly over time, it's going to be very enticing. Look at the world, man. Look, look at what we have to offer. Isn't it nice? And, you know, it doesn't hurt anybody. And, you know, your beliefs are fine over here. But, but, um, but there, was, there was a group of guys. Well, actually, I, I better finish saying what I was going to say about, about Antiochus. So, so, well, actually, I'm, I'm on the right track with the story here. Watch. Okay. This, this group of guys called the Maccabees rose up to fight against this process. Uh, no one was bugging them at the time, but, but, but they saw this process taking place, secularization, despising God's law. And these guys, these guys were fervent. They loved the Father. They loved, they loved the law of God. They saw what was happening. They saw that the world was coming in and, and trying to destroy God's people by, by turning them secular. Okay. And they took up arms and they picked up swords and they fought. I'm not, I'm not promoting physical violence. In fact, how the story ends, it, it'll, it'll show you that this, this is not how God's going to solve the Antichrist by us all taking up arms and, and fighting against, you know, people. Not, not at all. That's, that's not how this was solved, all right, this, this uh, situation. Uh, they started fighting. In 168 BC, uh, Antiochus did this act. And um, can, does anyone want to guess? So what he did is he, is he built this statue uh, of Zeus, he put his own face on it. He uh, sacrificed a pig, and then he took the pig, which is very like non-kosher, like that's like the ultimate insult to God's dietary laws, right? That the Jews observed. He took the pig into the temple, and he cooked the pig in there, and then took the broth from cooking the pig and poured it over over like Torah scrolls 
inside the temple, just just completely just in God's face and God's people, right? Just, just horrible. And and then he, and then he presented himself as if he was God, right? Does anyone want to guess how long he he occupied the holy temple in Jerusalem? What what am I saying here? Major architect, three and a half years. Gold star for Tom. Yep, from 168 BC to 164 BC, and 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 so this and so it really was like what we could call an abomination of desolation, but it wasn't the ultimate one. It, it there there are always types and shadows. There's always precedent. This is helpful to us. There's always precedents in history that we can look back. And, and, and point to it and say, oh, wow, this is a type. It's a shadow. It's a, it's a foreshadow. It's an archetype. So let's study this out. And what, is it, what does this mean to us today who are getting ready or on the verge of experiencing the ultimate manifestation of this, of this thing, the, the actual ultimate antichrist, the actual ultimate abomination of desolation? Stay with me. There's something to learn here. I do want to finish the story of the Hanukkah miracle. You know, I'm going to read this real quick, okay, because I, I want you to see, see if you catch what's interesting. This is directly out of the book of Maccabees, uh, 1 Maccabees uh, chapter 1, verses 54 through 57. Then on the 15th day of Chislev, which is a Jewish uh, Hebrew month, uh, in the 145th year, they erected a desolate, a desolating sacrilege upon the altar of burnt offering that's here. They also built all altars in the surrounding cities of Judah, the books of the law, would you hear right there? The books of the law, which they found, they tore to pieces and burned with fire. It's, it's directly hating God's law. It, does the world more and more treat God's word like that? I, I mean, do we see people like having a visceral reaction to the Bible now? Like, like, like you quote the Bible and, and in some circles, violence might ensue? Yes or no? Absolutely. There's a full on assault against God's word. That's, that's, this is what happened, you know, 2,000 years ago. Can we learn from this? My gosh, yes, because history repeats itself for real, okay? Where the book of the covenant was found, that's the, that's the Torah at that time, the Bible, right? In the possession of anyone, or if anyone adhered to the law, the decree, the king, the decree of the king condemned him to death. So that was the penalty for obeying God's law. You, you get killed. You're condemned to death. Right? And I'll read this down here. The desolating sacrilege was a statue of Zeus with the face of Antiochus Epiphanes, like I said, and it was erected atop the altar of burnt offering. There it is. After sacrificing a pig on it, uh, Antiochus then proclaimed himself to be Elohim, God. He then cooked the pig in the temple and poured its broth on the sacred Torah scrolls. No wonder uh, scholars say, well, that's what the abomination of desolation is. It's anti but again, it, it happened 200 years before Jesus and Paul both spoke of the event in the future tense. What does this mean for us? What's that? <laughs> well, who, oh, and the miracle. I'll tell you the miracle real quick. So you remember I said these guys took up arms and swords, and, and, and this is not me saying that this is what we should do or what we're going to do. Spiritually, yes, but these guys did it in the natural. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes was defeated and killed, but guess what? Not by the Maccabees, not at all. It was the craziest story. He had them fully subjugated. They were hiding in caves. Uh, uh, Masada was one, one of their locations, right? But, um, but what happened is that he, Antiochus got news that, that they, were, they were having trouble over in India, which was also part of his kingdom, and they were giving his people, his, his soldiers a bad time over there. It's all about taxes, you know, just like it is today. I mean, let's just be blunt. That's, that's why they wouldn't kill everybody, because the ultimate goal for, for the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Seleucid Empire, was just to get taxes, ultimately, right? Well, uh, people were causing trouble over on the trade route, and Antiochus wasn't getting the tax money from India. So he got on his horse, and he got some soldiers. He said, okay, I'm Antiochus. I'm, I'm like God, or I am God. I'm going to go over there and set this straight. Uh, he got there. It's a weird story. He got, I forget how it went exactly, but he got like knocked off his horse and his, sorry, Wanda, his gut split open and he laid there on the, in the dirt and just died this like very unceremonious, you know, insulting, embarrassing death. That's how the guy died. It was not by the Maccabees. Okay. God did it right? That's God's hand. It's like, okay, this guy's had his three and a half years. He's done. And God took him off. And in the most unceremonious, insulting, embarrassing way, he killed the guy, right? God did. God did. Not these guys. But now he's gone. The, the guy who he had temporarily left in charge in Jerusalem said, you know what? I'm out of here. I, I just, I got to get back home to Damascus. This is, this is a disaster. They all left. 
and and just like that a miracle the jews had their land, their 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 nation back and their holy city and the temple mount and the holy temple and the the priests after three and a half long years finally re-entered the, the temple, and this is in the holy, or what's called the outer sanctuary. That's one of the several objects there. There's also the incense altar to the to the right of this, and then the table shell bread, right? And behind this curtain is what, John? What's behind the, the veil? That's the Holy of Holies, and what, what's that in there? The Ark. The Ark of the Covenant, but not in this time, fortunately. By this time, it was already hidden in its secret chamber underneath uh, the foundation stone. But, but it was still present, so the, the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, was still present there. But, um, but, but yeah, but the, but the, the Holy Menorah uh, s- sits right in front of the Holy of Holies. And, and we're, I'm going to wrap it up with, with this. And I do have more to share on this, but it won't take long in our next class. Um, very important stuff, but, but I'm going to wrap it up with, with what we're talking about at the moment. So, Ben, how many nights is Hanukkah? Eight. Eight. How many... Um, uh, lamps do you see on the menorah? Seven. Seven. So I don't get it. What is, what is, because this is the miracle. This is the Hanukkah miracle. And, and you guys know Hanukkah. They, they light the candles, right? From, from right to left. They write, they light the one, one candle each night. Okay. What, what the miracle is that they're celebrating is first of all, this, this guy's gone. They got the Holy temple back. They got, they got God's law back. They, they, they weren't going to be killed for, for loving God's law, okay? Uh, when they went into the temple, they found the menorah, and they said, you know what? We, we're going to light this thing, and that's, that's, this, is part, this is one of our commandments. Day one, man, they didn't hesitate. Went right in there. They've got the fire. We're going to light that thing. What, do you, what, what did they find inside the temple? What, what do you need to light that lamp besides a flame? Oil, Oil yes. There. What they found in the temple was, was only enough oil for one day. Okay, so so here's here's natural thinking. Okay, natural thinking is okay. We got oil for one day, so just take a deep breath, hold tight. You know we haven't had this for three and a half years. Don't be impatient. You know where do we need to go to get to get oil? Oh, the oil we can get it, but but the nearest holy oil that is kosher for use in the temple is four days from here, four days journey. So let's see, that's four days there. Grab the oil, four days back. How many days is that? That's eight days. So natural thinking would be, well, don't light the menorah. We, we only have enough for one day. Wait till the guy, they sent a priest, right? It's not what happened. They, by faith, they said, no, God has, has delivered us from the hand of this, this evil person, this archetype of the Antichrist. They didn't word it that way, of course. And, and given us back our holy temple, given us back the law, okay? It, you know, d- delivered us completely. No, another miracle. And by faith, we're going to light the holy menorah, which represents what? It's the, the Shekinah, the Rach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that anointing of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and, um, and, and, and they, they lit it. Oh, and also, here's what I want to point out, too. Remember, too, our, our seven layers of the seven churches, this is how they're symbolized in the book of Revelation, the seven lampstands, right? Isn't that cool? So one day's oil, eight days journey. They sent the priest to get the oil. They lit the menorah. And guess what the miracle is? Yeah, one, one day's worth of oil, and it burned brightly, steadily for eight full days until the priest could return with oil. So that's what the Jews are celebrating when they, when they light the menorahs. If you come to the synagogue on Sunday with me, we're, we're going to do that. We have menorahs, we light them, and then we eat the jelly-filled donuts, soup on you, oh, you'll love it. <laughs> so food for thought, 7 o'clock on Sunday, right? So, um, so he, here's the point I'll end with tonight, and I do have a, another uh, important component of this. So I want you to come back um, in two weeks. We're going to resume this teaching, please, and those watching online too. But don't forget, that doesn't mean don't come next week. Please come next week uh, because, again, Adi is going to be giving her presentation. It's going to be very, very good. And, and again, what's her presentation about? Hanukkah. We're talking about Hanukkah, right? So now, now you guys know more about Hanukkah than I think most Jews know or a lot of Jews know, <laughs> strangely enough. Okay. Please, what does this have to do with us? What, why do I bring this up? What, what, what does this have to do with this thing here? I mean, we know that Antiochus... You know that that he that he forbade God's law uh, upon penalty of death. We know he was a type and foreshadow of the ultimate Antichrist. We know that the spirit of Antichrist is lawlessness; that it's running rampant in the in the in the in the world and even in the church, infiltrating the church. Lawlessness, uh, despising God's law, and and again, despising God's law can also include just kind of treating it casually, lightly, ignoring. It's not important. God doesn't care what I do. Okay. God, you know, I'm, I'm saved by grace. Jesus washed away my sin. So, um, 
So, so here's what I want to say. If this, think about this, this is good. This is good. Okay. In fact, after I say this, every one of you and everyone watching online, you're going to, you're going to go straight to Amazon and get a copy of the, of the book of Maccabees, first Maccabees and second Maccabees. Uh, I've got it somewhere, but it's like in the garage. So I'm literally going to buy a new copy for myself because I, I want to read this again. It's, it's extraordinary because if this guy symbolizes, I mean, like in so, like on every possible level, the, the antichrist who's coming in our near future, whose spirit is rampant in our world, right? Do, do, do you, are you tracking with me there? He, he symbolizes the antichrist, right? Okay. Then what do these guys represent? The guy's fighting against him and this thing. Again, I'm not, I'm not recommending we take up arms to fight. I don't mean that, a physical fight. Again, it was God who solved it. It wasn't solved militarily. But what was it that they were fighting against? They were fighting against what the Seleucids were trying to do, what the Greeks had, had done before them, what the Romans came in later and tried to do, what, what our world, what our nation, what's happening in our nation today and throughout the world is trying to do right now. Idolatry and secularization. Everybody say that word, secularization. That's a long word. Secular. It's, 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 you can go to church. You can, you can quote the Bible. It's fine. You could, you could pay tithes if you want to, pay offerings, whatever. Uh, you can, every time the church doors are open, that, that's fine. But you know what? Just, it just, just treat it lightly. That's just, that's, it's a small part of your life. It just kind of makes you feel better. It, it gives you reassurances. No, no. We, if this is a type of the Antichrist, this should be a type of the church in these days that the spirit of Antichrist is rising. We fight against lawlessness, which means that, that, that despite of God's law, the people who, who despise God's law, and we fight it inside of ourselves too, okay? Uh, we, we have to, we ha- it's, it, this, is, this is why we're reading the book of Revelation. This is, this is one thing we're supposed to be in. We have to love God's law, Okay. And, um, you know, I keep going, but it's already 720. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oh, that's so funny. Devo says, goes full circle to eating wrong foods. Dang. <laughs> maybe, maybe. And you know what? We'll talk about that again when we come back in two weeks and resume this, this lesson, right? But, um, but, but what we're going to do when we come back is we're going to talk about uh, the way that we fight lawlessness. Because are you guys ready for this? We're supposed to hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. We're supposed to hate that spirit of lawlessness. Jesus used the word hate. We're supposed to hate that spirit of lawlessness. So, so we as a last day's church, the army of God, we have to rise up and fight against it. In two weeks, we'll resume. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to go into the last point of the first letter. And I promise you, can I make this promise? Yes. I promise you that before our next class is over in two weeks, that we will be into the second letter. Is that cool? John, your face looks like a, like a statue. Like, don't be this guy, man. You look like a, like a statue, <laughs> right? So, but, but don't forget, please come back next week, and I'm going to go ahead and put up this slide again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for uh, staying online with us. We still have 14 people watching. Yay for my online audience. You guys stuck with us. I, I, I do appreciate that. I, I love our online viewers very, very much. Um, but again, next week is a D. She's wonderful. She's a great speaker, expert on the Holocaust. She'll be teaching us about Hanukkah in that context. Very pertinent to us. Isn't this all a type and foreshadow of the Antichrist too? The Holocaust, Hitler, all that, right? So very, very pertinent to us when we talk about it in here. Uh, she's amazing. So, so next Thursday, everybody got it? So with that, I love you guys too. I've got, well, my aunt at least said, love you. Love you too, Aunt Pam. <laughs> so um, yeah, let me close in prayer. Yeah, really love you guys. So much appreciate you. Oh, yeah, you, you just don't know. That, yes, uh, go ahead. Did you see that prayer request in the chat? I didn't see it. What's the prayer request? Let me go. So we have a prayer request in our chat. We don't want to, we don't want to miss that. So yeah, see, see if you can find that. And thank you, Father, for shutting off the fire alarm, too. So we just didn't give up, did we? <laughs> and Peter, watching from Africa, one of our African pastors, we thank the Lord for these revelations. Amen. So, Father God, and Ben, when you catch it, just, uh, okay, I'll, I'll check with you before I finish praying. So, Father God, we just thank you for tonight, Father God. We just thank you for the um, gift of your law, Father God. Uh, we, we thank you that you sent uh, Jesus to to uh, wash away our sins and to make us pure and spotless and clean so that we can be the temple of your Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, but we know, Father, we, we acknowledge this, Father, Jesus did not come. He did not abolish the law. The law is pure and holy, and we love your law, Father God. Um, and, and that law it symbolizes you, the, the, those Ten Commandments, 
uh, inside the Ark of the Covenant, and that symbolizes our heart, uh, Father God. And, and, and we just we, we ask you, Lord, write your law in our hearts, just like your word says. We, we just invite that, Lord. Lord, um, we thank you for the gift of your son, uh, Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross uh, for us so that, again, we could be spotless clean. We can be spotless clean and be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for dwelling inside of us. We invite you in uh, fresh and anew right now. Uh, refill our lamps to full. I thank you, everyone in this room, everyone watching online, everyone who watches this video later on. Just uh, fill our lamps to full. Refill us to full. And, and and, and fill us with that, that holy anointing, Holy Spirit. And as I always pray, Holy Spirit, uh, we ask you, Father, we ask you uh, through your Holy Spirit to anoint us for perfection and to be perfect in all things that pertain to us. And we give you all the glory and praise tonight. I ask you just uh, bless each one as they go tonight, each one in the class, each one watching online. Long life, divine health, increased prosperity, love, peace, and joy. And Ben, did you find the prayer request? Yes, okay. What is it? Okay, you know, I didn't even see Lisa online. That's actually my sister-in-law. She lives in, um, she lived in Alabama. Lisa, you have to remind me where you live now. I should know. I sent you my books. I don't remember your the state you're in. Anyways, yes, Father, we just lift up um, my sister-in-law, uh, Lisa, her her mother. We just lift her up to you. We just thank you, Father, for divine healing over her. Uh, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're ministering peace to uh, Lisa and her children and her family and her mom and everyone involved in that situation. And we just uh, proclaim, again, like, like I just prayed for everybody, long life and divine health over uh, Lisa and her mother and that household. We bind every attack of the enemy in that situation. Um, we, we cast those mountains into the sea like Jesus gave us authority to do. We cast those mountains of, of sickness and disease into the sea and we call Lisa's mom um, healed and whole. And I pray that for everyone listening and watching, again, divine health, long life, increased prosperity, love, peace, and joy. Uh, thank you, Father. Bless each one as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for coming. Love you. And uh, we'll see you next week, right? Okay, God bless. Oh, yes, and in the meantime, remember to stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, okay.